So thank you so much for having me. Um, you know, this is my first time to Las Vegas, so that's been quite an experience. Um, and it's been a good one so far, but there's definitely a lot to see and do here. Uh, the reason I came here is because I heard um, back in Cleveland about all the fantastic things that were happening here at the center. And I work with a lot of patients that have dementia and memory problems. And so I wanted to come here and see firsthand what they were doing. So I know that in this community, um, this center has done a lot. And only being here two days so far, I've witnessed that. So it's a pretty incredible um, opportunity to be able to be here with you. Today I'm going to talk about the Baby Boomer's Guide to Brain Health. Um, we get a lot of questions in our geriatric center back home about you know, memory, what can I do to preserve my memory, and concerns about that. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. I'll go through the presentation, and then at the end we'll open it up for questions. So um, if you have questions as we go, write them down, and I'll try to address them at the end. Is there a trick to make it? There it goes. So today uh, we're going to talk about normal aging and what's normal in terms of memory. Uh, we get that question a lot, is forgetfulness normal? And then we'll talk about dementia and focus on the different types of dementia, the causes, the diagnosis and treatment, and then we'll spend some time on prevention. We're also going to talk about two topics that affect uh, patients who have memory problems. Uh, one are finances, managing your finances, and another is driving. And uh, we get a lot of questions about that as well. So we'll, we'll discuss that today. So when is memory loss significant? Um, if you look here on the slide, you can see sort of a stepwise progression of memory. So normal, uh, as you age, your brain doesn't move as quickly as when you were younger. So you may notice that it's harder to recall names of someone you've just met, or maybe it's hard to remember the word that you want to think of. The other thing that happens frequently is it's harder to multitask. So uh, you know, when you're younger, you can do three or four things well all at the same time. But uh, as you get older, it's more difficult to do that. And that's normal. That's a normal part of aging. The next step is called mild cognitive impairment. And, and this is um, sort of a uh, step above dementia. So some of these patients will develop dementia, some will not. And in this uh, syndrome, usually we see there is a complaint about memory, but usually not by the patient. Usually the family or the friends are noticing that there's a memory problem. And um, when we compare their testing, their memory testing, to people of the same age and the same education level, it's not that they don't score as well. So that's how we know sometimes that there is a problem. Usually um, the function, so your day-to-day -day activities are not affected with this kind of impairment. So you can still do things like, you know, get dressed, bathe yourself, drive, feed yourself, do grocery shopping, cooking, cleaning, and those things aren't affected, but day to day there are some forgetfulness, repeating yourself that family is noticing is increasing. So it's not dementia at this point. And then the third step um, is Alzheimer's disease, which is a type of dementia, and I think that's the one that everyone's most uh, you know, familiar with. Before we get into more about dementia, I wanna talk about the three Ds. So the three Ds uh, are three syndromes that all can present with memory loss. And it's something that as physicians, when someone comes in with a memory complaint, we look at all of these to make sure that we're not missing something else. So the first one is delirium. Now delirium is actually an acute change. So when I say acute, I mean days to hours, um, sometimes in minutes in onset. So the person will be fine and then the next hour or day, they're very confused. Um, it will fluctuate, meaning the person will be completely with it, and then they'll be confused, and it will alternate back and forth. They're also very inattentive, so it's harder to follow conversation with this syndrome. Usually we see this in patients who are hospitalized. So if you take an older adult who has an illness and they're hospitalized, it's, it's common, unfortunately, to develop delirium in the hospital. This is considered a medical emergency, 
and about 5 to 10 percent of patients who develop delirium um, will die. So it's a pretty serious syndrome, and when we see it in the hospital, it's a marker that there's something uh, you know, going on underneath the surface. Usually it's the result of something else. So the most common one that people are familiar with are urinary tract infections. Uh, that's a common cause of delirium. But also dehydration, falls, um, a reaction to a medication, all of those can cause delirium as well. So usually the patients, like I said before, who are affected are those who are in the hospital or in a nursing home facility, but you do see some community adults when they get ill develop delirium. So the best thing is to treat the underlying cause. That's what we do. So if there's an infection, we treat it. If the patient's dehydrated, we give them fluids. And this usually resolves. Now, about 50% of the time, it takes a couple of months for them to get completely back to normal. But the important thing to remember about delirium is that it's very acute. And you'll see when we talk about dementia, it's not acute. You know, there's not a change day to day. The next one I'm going to talk about is depression. Um, so depression is, you know, feeling down or sad. And um, it's difficult in older adults because they frequently don't complain of feeling down or sad. They have other symptoms that we need to look out for with depression. Um, usually they complain of physical complaints like nausea, you know, increase in pain, uh, those kind of things. So you have to be a little more creative when you're considering this diagnosis because not every older adult is going to say, I feel sad. You know, there are other things to look for. Um, usually there's difficulty with sleep, poor appetite. Sometimes there can be memory problems if the depression is severe. Uh, and usually these symptoms last for two weeks or more. And they affect your day-to-day -day functioning. Uh, other, older white males actually have the highest rate of suicide if you look at all groups, so elder uh, Caucasian males. So it's really important that we look out for this uh, and treat it appropriately. And you can get what's um, ca called a pseudo-dementia, so someone presents like they have dementia, but they actually have depression and you treat the depression and their memory improves. So it's an important thing to rule out. The other important thing to know about depression is untreated, it can worsen other conditions. The most common one is uh, heart problems. So, you know, uh, cardiac disease, different arrhythmias, there's pretty good data saying that it can worsen those conditions. So it's very important to treat. And then finally, what we're going to spend the rest of the talk on is dementia, which is a syndrome that is progressive over time that usually involves short-term memory impairment. So comparing this to delirium and depression, you see a slow progression over time, uh, specifically with the memory complaints. So dementia is just a general term for decline in your ability uh, to function, and it interferes with your day-to-day -day activities, your ability to take care of yourself. So Alzheimer's is the most common type of dementia. Unfortunately, in medicine, we like to uh, make things difficult, and we always come up with new terminology for different things. So uh, just in the last year, they've come up with this new terminology for dementia. And the reason I mention it is not because I think it's important to remember, but I think that as the news starts to follow this, they're going to start using this terminology, so you'll be aware of what it is. So they're now call calling dementias neurocognitive disorders. So there's major and minor neurocognitive disorders. Major neurocognitive disorders are the dementias. It's the same thing as dementia as before. So you have a decline in your ability to do your day-to-day -day activities, and you really need some help functioning um, on a day-to-day -day basis. And then the mi minor neurocognitive disorders, you have some measurable memory loss, but it doesn't affect your function day-to-day. Just so you know that that terminology is out there and they're trying to transition us to using that instead of the word dementia. So there are many types um, of dementia. The most common type is Alzheimer's disease. And I think that's the one that the community is most familiar with. Uh, next comes vascular dementia, meaning you know stroke after stroke. Sometimes uh, strokes can cause uh, dementia and difficulty with memory. And then you can see that there's a small percentage of what's called Lewy body disease, which is uh, a dementia we see r more rare uh, than the other two. 
And then there's uh, this entire list here on the bottom right of the slide of various other types of rare dementias. But I would say in my practice and experience, the vast majority um, are Alzheimer's or vascular. And of, you know, humans don't necessarily follow the medical book. So it's, most of the time when you see someone with dementia, it's sort of a mixed, we call a mixed picture, meaning there's more than one cause. So it doesn't necessarily change the treatment, but if you hear that term mixed dementia, that's what they, they mean. So symptoms of dementia can vary. You need an impairment in at least two core uh, functions of memory, so or core mental functions. Memory is one of those, short-term memory. Another one is communication and language. So often patients will complain of word finding difficulties, you know, in a conversation they can't think of what they want to say or they have trouble naming an object like a watch or a pen. A third area is reasoning and judgment. So being able to understand that they need to plan, uh, you know, for example, going to the grocery store, that requires some planning, right? You have to make a list or have a, a mental list of what you need to get. You need to figure out how to drive to the store and then figure out where things are in the store, check out and make correct change if you're using cash or you know, write a check and then drive home. So that's a very complex <laughs> task to go to the grocery store and you need reasoning and judgment to be able to do that. As I had mentioned previously, the symptoms of dementia are progressive. So they start out very slowly um, and then over time they gradually worsen and become more obvious. So what are the causes of dementia? We know that there's damage to the brain cells and the damage to the brain cells makes it so they cannot communicate with one another. And when they can't communicate, your thinking, your behavior, and your feelings change. So the brain is divided up into many regions, each responsible for a different sort of function. So when, you did, when the brain cells in one area are damaged, they can't carry out their normal functions. So that's why sometimes a patient will present with only word finding difficulty. That's because it's that area of their brain that's affected versus short term memory is another area. Um, we don't know the exact specific cause, but we're getting closer um, with the research that's going on now. And I, I hope in my career we'll find out the cause and be able to have an effective treatment uh, for dementia. So the changes that cause dementia are usually permanent. There are some conditions that you can treat that may improve the cognition. So if you have depression, like I mentioned before, and you treat the depression, you may have some improvement in the memory. Uh, that's possible. Medications can cause some difficulty with memory. So if you stop the medication, you may have an improvement. Um, alcohol use chronically over time is not good for the brain. Uh, so we discourage that. Thyroid problems and vitamin deficiencies can also cause this, although in my experience, treating those, you usually get just a little bit of improvement, not dramatic. But it can happen. I mean, it's possible, just I haven't seen it very frequently. In terms of a workup, there uh, are several blood tests to do. Usually physicians will do a complete blood count and a comprehensive metabolic panel. So that's checking for anemia, checking all the electrolytes in the blood, the renal function, you know, are the kidneys working, are the is the liver doing okay. We always check vitamin B12 and thyroid because those can contribute, like I just said, to uh, memory problems. And in some populations we check, check an RPR, which is for syphilis, because tertiary syphilis, it's very rare, but it can cause memory problems and it's treatable and you can get a pretty good rebound of memory. Uh, but that's you know, a very small population that we do that in. I'm gonna jump down to imaging. Uh, usually we order a CT of the brain or an MRI of the brain to get a good idea of what the, the structure is. Make sure there's nothing like a tumor or you know, some vascular abnormality that could be contributing to the dementia. Um, here actually, they're doing more <coughs> genetic testing and PET scans and that's not something that I use in my practice. Uh, because we're not doing as much research. But here they are doing that, and I think that's where we're going to see this going because you can get a lot of information from a PET scan about the type of dementia you're dealing with. 
Uh, unfortunately, insurance companies are very strict about when they cover for that expensive test. So I think that's also a hindrance, but I hope in the next decade that that will become part of the standard because I do think it will help us figure out uh, the different causes for a patient's dementia. The genetic testing is also for a small group of people, you know, sort of the run of the mill patient. It's not necessary to do genetic testing. However, if there is a pretty good family history of a younger onset, so I mean 40s and 50s, that's young in my world. I only see pe people over the age of 65. So if you have someone in their 40s and 50s who's developing some memory loss, I think it's reasonable to do some genetic testing. There's not one gold standard test that we say this is the test to diagnose dementia. What it takes is a history, usually from a patient and a family member, then a really great physical exam, and then some sort of memory testing. So uh, there are a couple of memory tests that we use. One's called the mini mental status exam, and one's called the uh, Montreal uh, Cognitive Assessment. Uh, we use both of them depending on education level, and we can compare that to what's expected for your age and your education level to see if it's abnormal. But a lot of times we don't have the exact cause. We can't tell a patient, this is the reason you have this dementia. We're just not there yet in terms of our technology. And treatment depends on, on the cause. And there's nothing that stops this from progressing long term. Uh, but there are drugs that in the short term can help. So there are two classes of medications approved by the FDA for the treatment of dementia. The first uh, category are the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Now there's three medications in that class right now, uh, Aricept, Exelon, and Razodyne. And you can see the generic names there as well. So these are for mild to moderate dementia. And in studies, what it showed is it slows the rate of progression. And I think it's important to know a little bit about the studies that they did on these medications. So when they, when they looked at this, what they did is they looked at test scores, memory test scores. So they were able to show if you were on these medications that you had an increase um, of several points on your test score uh, if you were taking this. Now, I don't know if that means these people were functioning better, right? So what does it mean if you score higher on a test but you still can't button your shirt or understand how to button your shirt? But it's the best data that we have for these medications. So we do use them, but it's important to understand it's not gonna change what's already happening. It seems to just slow down the progression of the disease. The second class is, are the NMDA receptor antagonists like Namenda, that's the drug in that class. And this one is well tolerated. It has less side effects than the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, it can be used for moderate to severe dementia, and you can use it with one of the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors. Uh, the acetylcholinesterase inhibitors, you can get a lot of GI side effects like diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, which can lead to weight loss, which we never like in older adults because unfortunately, as an older adult, you don't lose fat, you lose muscle, which we don't like. So we always look out for that with these medications. But Nomenda seems to have less of those side effects. There are a lot of alternative treatments that I want to discuss because I usually get a lot of questions on this when I give this talk. The first one is Axona or Ketacin. So the active ingredient in this uh, therapy is caparillic acid. And, uh, these Axona and Ketacin are actually two different products, but they, they have the same active ingredient, so I grouped them together. So there was a phase two clinical trial that showed marginal benefit. And what that means is the FDA requires these different phases of trials to test medications. And phase two is to determine if it's safe and what dose should they give people to test it in a phase three trial to see if it's actually effective. So this phase two trial had 150 people, which is pretty small. And most of the people in the study were taking dementia medications already. And they put them on Axona or they gave them a sugar pill. And they did see improvement in memory testing compared to the sugar pill, to, compared to the placebo. But it was very small. And this is such a small sample size, I don't know really what that means. And then the manufacturer decided to not pursue further 
uh, clinical trials. So I don't know if they didn't publish some of their data because it seems like if, if your data was great, you would go to the next step to market the medication. So uh, we, we don't really recommend this. I do have some patients that use coconut oil instead because that uh, caparilic acid is in coconut oil. Uh, I, I don't recommend it because I don't have any studies to back up that recommendation, but I don't think coconut oil is going to harm you. I don't think you can eat that much coconut oil. You know, it's so rich, but it's something to think about. The next uh, alternative treatment is coenzyme Q10, which is a naturally occurring antioxidant. And uh, we don't really know the safety of coenzyme Q10. So, when it's taken as a supplement, we don't have a lot of evidence that it helps dementia, and we don't know is there a dose where it becomes unsafe and there's side effects. Um, so it's something to, uh, uh, to think about. Again, I don't feel that I can recommend it to my patients because there's, for dementia, I don't think that there's good benefit. The next three um, you've probably heard about as well. One is coral calcium. So the difference between coral calcium and regular calcium, oops, what's this? Is that it, this calcium comes from the shells uh, from coral reef, and it contains additional minerals versus the calcium that you normally buy at the store. Now, there's not really a proven benefit that this helps memory, and it's not regulated. So the calcium you buy at the store Although it's a supplement, you can buy it where they've regulated it. So they test the pills, they make sure the dose on the bottle is the dose in the medication. This one, we uh, don't know, you know, we don't know what's in it. it. It could be nothing. It could just be a powder, or it could be more calcium than it says on the bottle. And again, there's not really a, any great scientific evidence that we should take this for memory. And actually, the FDA filed a complaint against uh, this company for you know, saying they didn't have the evidence to support the claims they were making and that they felt that it was wrong for the population to be seeing this kind of thing. So um, that's always interesting because you don't see that too often where the FDA gets upset enough to file a sanction against the company. So I think that's uh, telling in itself. Ginkgo is probably the most common supplement I'm asked about. It's from a plant and actually in Europe, it's used pretty frequently for memory. It's also used in you know, ancient Chinese medicine uh, for, for memory. There was a phase three trial, so that you know, is above a phase two, like we talked about, where they looked at giving ginkgo to uh, people who did not have dementia or had mild cognitive impairment. They gave it twice a day to half the people, and the other half the people got a sugar pill twice a day. And they followed them every six months for six years to see if they had any improvement in memory and it showed no difference. So it was kind of a bummer. It was done by the um, NIH, actually, and I think a lot of us were hopeful that this would be something we could recommend, but they just didn't find any difference. Finally are the omega-3 fatty acids. So there are two types of those omega-3 fatty acids, DHA and EPA. DHA is actually uh, the omega-3 fatty acid that's used in the brain. So you can understand why scientists would think if you gave some DHA, maybe it would help with memory loss, and that's a decent hypothesis. But, um, and there are good recommendations and great studies for if you have coronary artery disease for omega-3 fatty acids. That uh, is a pretty clear benefit. Um, especially up to three grams a day, you have some pretty good risk reduction. There is um, some possible reduction with dementia, but the two studies they're, they weren't great results. So let me tell you a little bit about them. One was the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study. So if you have the genetic uh, marker for Alzheimer's disease, which remember a small uh, portion of the population has, the ApoE4 gene, you might have slight benefit if you take omega-3 fatty acids. They did find that in a study. So that's interesting. Although I don't know how many of my patients have the genetic marker because we're not routinely testing for it in day-to-day -day practice. The second study was called the MIDAS study. So it was memory improvement with DHA. And they uh, gave older adults with, uh, who had some cognitive impairment about 900 milligrams a day of omega-3 fatty acids. And the DHA group scored higher on memory testing versus the sugar group, the sugar pill group. But they had no improvement in function. So again, it's one of those things where your test score goes up, but what does it mean for your day-to-day -day life? 
they didn't find any improvement. Next, I'm going to talk about two things that we get asked about a lot. One are finances in dementia, managing money, and then also driving. Uh, because when you have some memory impairment, your ability to do these two tasks is impaired. And sometimes it's hard for caregivers and family members to know what to look for, when to look for it, and when there should be concern. So financial exploitation is actually a type of elder abuse. Um, it's an illegal or improper use of someone's funds, money, or assets. Examples include forging a signature, cashing a check, misusing an elder's money, or coercing an adult to, you know, into signing something they don't really want to sign. We see frequently, unfortunately, uh, older adults who have dementia who are the victim of scams. And when you have mild cognitive impairment, <clears throat> excuse me, or dementia, you're at risk for these types of scams. So I'm sure you've seen them in the mail, you know, the fake check scams, the advanced fee loans, the prizes, you've won a million dollars in Argentina, those kind of things. Um, <coughs> excuse me. The other one we're seeing a lot of are the family caregiver rescue scams where they're told their loved one, their granddaughter is in another country and they need to send money to free them. And when you have dementia or mild cognitive impairment, it's difficult to reason and judge that this may be fake. So the, they think they're doing the caring thing by reacting, but actually um, you know, they need some assistance kind of thinking through this type of thing. I think this graph is the most interesting. Um, this is from a study in JAMA actually a couple years ago. So what you'll see is on the left-hand side of the screen um, going up the y-axis is your ability to manage finances. And then across the top is normal aging all the way to severe Alzheimer's dementia. So in normal aging, you have minimal changes in your ability to manage finances. So an example would be you can't multitask while you're balancing your checkbook. That's normal part of aging. Um, however, when you get diagnosed with mild cognitive impairment, you have difficulty already doing complex financial skills. So that's you know, understanding your bank statement, managing bills, judging appropriately for your finances. And one thing I always point out is that's a very early stage of problem. Um, and I think usually we think about finances later on. But you can see it starts earlier uh, from this study they did. So I always counsel my patients and their family members to have someone additional besides the patient start looking over things. They don't have to completely hand it over, but that way you ensure that there's no financial exploitation for the patient. Once you get into mild Alzheimer's dementia, you, you know, most of your ability to manage finances has uh, left because it's just such a complex task for your brain and the damage that the dementia is causing. You're unable to do it. So, I think this is an interesting slide because it always reminds me that earlier than I think I should be mentioning this to people to watch out for. When you have mild cognitive impairment, you're four times more likely than a, a person who doesn't have mild cognitive impairment to make errors. And it, because of the damage from the dementia, you're also less risk adverse. So you, you can see older adults who are wanting to gamble more, for example. In Las Vegas, I'm not sure how that works. But um, I had a patient the other day that one of her hobbies was always gambling. But as she has aged and developed dementia, that's sort of taken a new life um, of itself. And the daughter was unsure, you know, how much should I let her do? It's something she enjoys, but she doesn't really understand what she's doing. And then the, the topic that always makes everyone upset is dementia and driving. So <laughs> dementia patients are at higher risk for auto accidents. And actually, it's uh, equal to the risk of a teenage driver, a brand new teenage driver. So that's high. Um, and the reason is, is because it's not just the brain's ability to function, but it's also physically. So I mean, your whole body is controlled by your brain. And your brain has damage from the dementia. You're not able to really react as quickly. Um, you can't be as self-aware. And you really can't determine effectively if you have the capacity to drive safely. And this is really a public health issue because we're living longer, which is fantastic, but it also means there's more drivers on the road who are greater than 65. 
80% um, actually of those over uh, age 65 are driving and about 30% of people with dementia are still driving. So it's an important thing to be aware of as a family member or a caregiver to watch out for that. Um, one thing we tell people is don't have the, the patient drive by themselves. So the best way to get an idea if there's a problem is to get in the car with them. I, I'm not that brave. Um, my grandfather, um, he has dementia and um, he's still driving, um, much to my dismay of course. But the thing is is that um, my grandma does get in the car and she watches him drive. So she has a really good idea of what's going on. Um, the other thing you can do is only local, non-highway roads during the day. That's a safe step to take if driving is a big issue. In Ohio, we do formal driving evaluations. It's not required by the state, but most of my patients who have mild cognitive impairment or dementia, I send them for a driving evaluation. <coughs> Excuse me. What they do, it's an occupational therapist who gets in the car. They're probably the bravest people on the planet, if you ask me. They get in the car with these older adults. They um, watch them drive. They, they let them drive. They take them on the highway. They take them on back roads. They take them to stop signs, traffic lights, left turns, right turns. They also do some actual like sitting down and talking through scenarios to see if they can reason. And then they make a recommendation to me about this is, you know, I think they're safe to drive during daytime hours under these circumstances or it's absolutely unsafe. This, you know, this shouldn't be happening. Usually what we do when that happens, if we get a report that's completely unsafe, we let the patient, we tell the patient, you can either stop driving or we have to you know, report that you can't drive. Most people will choose on their own to not drive. It's terrible to have to take someone's license away and I, I don't like to do it and thankfully I've never had to when given a patient that, giving a patient that option. Um, in the United States, it's hard because driving is such a way of life here. It's most cities, it's difficult to get around if you don't have a car, but it, safety is the most important. And I always remind my patients, it's not just them. They could be the greatest driver in the world, but the reaction time could be slow. You could have a teenage driver on the road and they won't be able to react quickly enough. So it's just really a, a difficult topic, but I like to bring it up here because I usually get questions about when should we stop driving, you know, if I have someone that has dementia. It's, it's a hard one. Uh, there, these are actually taken from the Alzheimer's Association website. If you've never checked out their website before, you should. It's a great resource. In Cleveland, they have a very active group, so I use them a lot for my patients. They have a whole page about myths and um, facts, and so I've taken some of that from here. Um, points that I think people sometimes get confused about. So the myth is that it's a common part of aging to lose your memory. So the truth is, is that it's normal, like we discussed, to have some difficulty with multitasking or remembering someone's name that you just met. But it's not normal to you know, misplace your keys every day or not know how to drive home or you know, not balance your checkbook appropriately. Uh, one myth um, that I think the, the media has actually picked up on recently is that Alzheimer's disease is not fatal. Um, actually, Alzheimer's disease has no survivors. We don't have a cure for this. I and mean, we don't even really have an effective treatment. And I've seen a lot of news sto stories recently that are talking about how we should really pump more money and funding into studying this because probably we underestimate the number of people each year who are dying because of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and Years ago, this is how cancer was, right? So cancer was always fatal. And that's not the case anymore. Most people know someone who's survived cancer for many years. So I hope um, in my career that, that this will change. Another myth is that only older people can get Alzheimer's. Um, that's, not that's, that's not true. So you can get early onset um, Alzheimer's, and, and that's very sad in the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Um, it's not very common, but it does happen. It's something to be aware of. So this is actually, um, we're gonna sort of transition to risks and prevention. Um, so there are some things that increase your risk of developing Alzheimer's disease. So that ApoE4 gene, which is the, the gene that we've identified that can cause dementia in some patients, that increases your risk. Um, other things that increase your risk are diabetes, um, midlife hyperlipidemia, which is high cholesterol or depression. Um, 
Males, traumatic brain injury, that, that increases the risk. You've seen all the stories about the NFL players um, and you know the hard hits to the head, so that's what that's talking about. And then if you're a smoker, that increases your risk. Things that reduce your risk, so um, there's some evidence that folic acid can reduce your risk a little bit, as well as the Mediterranean diet, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Moderate al alcohol consumption actually reduces your risk, which people usually feel really excited about, finally not <laughs> telling them to stop doing something they enjoy. But moderate, it, it, you have to keep in mind what that means. So, you know, probably a glass of red wine um, with dinner is probably the maximum I recommend for my patients. Um, and if they're falling, I say no alcohol because you don't need a broken hip. But there, there are some pretty good evidence that moderate alcohol consumption can reduce your risk. Uh, the more education you have, um, the, the more risk reduction you have uh, for developing dementia. We don't know why. And it's something kind of strange because we don't know, like, how can you change that? By the time we're talking to patients, most of them are not going back to get more education. And then those who participate in leisure activities actually have some risk reduction. So we'll talk about that more, too. The phrase I tell my patients is, whatever's good for your heart is good for your brain. You have to remember the brain has a lot of blood vessels it, that you know, bring it the nutrients. So anything that has been shown to be good for your heart, you should do it for the brain. So don't smoke, that's a big one. You wanna keep your blood pressure, your cholesterol, and your blood sugar if you're diabetic within normal limits and maintain a healthy weight. Those are all things that are good for many, many medical conditions and I think most medical providers would be on board with that. Uh, exercise has been shown for uh, good prevention as well. Uh, there was actually recently a study um, that came out looking at you know, doing cardiovascular exercise like running or walking versus resistance training, so weights. And they actually found the resistance training group had some more benefit. We don't know why that is, and I, don't re I tell my patients to do a combination. Um, so they should do cardiovascular, walking, biking, that kind of thing, and then also some weightlifting, either on machines or light hand weights. The Mediterranean diet is another thing I recommend to my patients. So what that is, is little uh, red meat, lots of whole grains, fruits, vegetables, fish and shellfish, nuts and olive oil. Um, the Mediterranean diet has, has some pretty good evidence of helping with um, preventing memory decline. So and it is just a generally healthy diet if you look at it uh, for a lot of medical conditions. The other thing is um, doing things that stimulate your brain really help prevent memory loss. So card games, I think the most common one I hear about are bridge, and the bridge games because you know they're social as well, which is great for the brain. Also crossword puzzles, um, puzzles in itself, anything like that, that where it requires some higher level of thinking, that, that's good for preventing any memory loss. And then finally, socialization. So patients who interact um, on a regular basis socially outside their home or with their family tend to have less memory loss than those who you sort of keep to themselves. I think as adults age, one of the complaints that my patients have um, is, well, as I've aged, a lot of my friends have passed away, which is really, that's sad, but it's true. So I recommend, um, in Cleveland, we have different day programs where you can go, even if you don't have dementia, um, and participate in different activities. And so for patients in that circumstance where a lot of their friends have moved away or passed away, I encourage them to do that so they can still get the social stimulation um, from interacting with people. So that sort of wraps up um, what I wanted to talk about today, but I know usually there's a lot of questions people have about memory and dementia and, you know, am I going to get Alzheimer's disease? So I'd be happy to take questions from here and then from our remote site. Yeah, go ahead. Back in the beginning you addressed symptoms. Yes. What about the visual perception? So some patients, you'll see that they'll actually have some visual disturbances, like um, they're not seeing as well as they used to, or they might actually not see part of their visual field. And that can, we'll see that if the cause is a stroke. So, and sometimes patients don't realize it. We just had a patient on Monday that didn't realize um, that that was occurring. Because you know, when something happens to you, you, and you deal with it every day, you don't necessarily notice. It's less common than the other symptoms listed. What other, could you have a question? 
I thought you said that one of the reduced risks was uh, higher education, higher cognitive uh, engagement, but then I thought you said it actually now was uh, 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 not good. No, so it is good at reducing risk of developing dementia um, to be more educated and also to be more engaged in brain activities, whether that's puzzles, crosswords. It's more, it will reduce your risk. It's good for you to do those things. Pardon? Oh, yeah, I'll repeat the question. Sir. Go ahead. Can you repeat the first part of your question? I didn't hear the first well, part. There's a term used in surgery, ICU dementia. Yes. So a patient will usually like heart, mm -hmm. kind of heart mass. And there's only so much insult that the individual can take. Right. So it's a, it's a matter of days or something before they've gone too far. So the question is about um, ICU-related dementia and the insult to the brain and, and how much can the brain take. I think what you're referring to, we do see um, there's actually good evidence that after cardiac surgery, um, patients are at high risk for developing some memory problems. Now, those patients um, are at high risk for also developing delirium, which we talked about that happens acutely. So usually when I cover the inpatient consult service at the Cleveland Clinic, we get a lot of consults from the cardiac floors, um, from all the cardiac surgery. And usually what happens is the patients develop a post-operative delirium where they're very confused coming out of anesthesia. It's slow to resolve. We see them in the outpatient setting six to eight weeks later, and they're better, but they never went back to where they were. And the thought is, de delirium used to be thought of as an individual entity, right? So it was a, a, a like disease, you treat it, the confusion goes away, and it doesn't have any effect. But what we're learning now is, is that when you have delirium, you should always follow several months later, because it can be an unmasking of some previously unidentified cognitive issues. So maybe there was something there before that the person was able to function well, and then they've taken this insult, like you said, and they just, they're never going to recover. That's not always the case, but we do see it. Other, go ahead. Uh, how, what is the role of genetics, <coughs> excuse me, what is the role of genetics in uh, the possibility of uh, developing? <coughs> yeah, so uh, the question is about the role of genetics in uh, the development of Alzheimer's. So the ApoE4 gene, what they look at is the number of alleles you have or the number of copies. So if you have two copies, um, you have higher risk than if you have one copy. Now, the problem is, is that sometimes you have this allele, this genetic marker, and you don't get the disease. So I don't know what that means. Um, but people are studying it. And um, there's actually uh, a lot of studies right now looking at that because they're thinking, we know this is a possible marker for genetics. But that's why a lot of us aren't using it, because we don't know how to interpret it. If I have a 30-year-old who has two copies of the gene, I, and I tell her, well, the, you, you have a chance of developing Alzheimer's, genetic Alzheimer's, but we have no treatment, and there's not a lot to do. I mean, what I've presented here for risk reduction, most people do that anyway. It's sort of hard to know what to do with the information. So I think hopefully in the next 10 years we'll have more and we'll be able to answer that question a lot better. One more, yeah, go ahead. Okay, I have a son who is 25 years old. Two years ago, um, for the past couple of years, he started having uh, he was taken into the hospital two years ago, and they did some tests, but they thought, uh, what they said was, that he had the beginning of Parkinson's disease. Mm -hmm. And they, one of the questions that they had asked, had he ever had a uh, trauma to the head? Mm -hmm. uh, he had when he was small, uh, and then when he was 17, he was attacked uh, with a baseball bat. Mm -hmm. And so they did this, they did these tests and stuff. But what they just recently now have said, they believe it's a thyroid disease. Hmm. So does that mean that he is more likely now to have Alzheimer's? 
Has he, when he gets older? Yeah, so the question is about her son has had um, just two head injuries, one that was pretty severe as a result of an assault, and uh, there's some confusion about the diagnosis. Uh, could it be Parkinson's? Um, and then recently it's been brought up that it maybe was the thyroid. So she's concerned, is there increased risk for Alzheimer's? Um, I, I think that you know, if you've had a traumatic brain injury, we know that there's increased risk for developing dementia. We don't know, um, you know why some people do develop it and some people don't. Um, if you take NFL players, for example. So there's a lot of NFL players who are older and don't have dementia, and they took a lot of hits. But yet you see the stories on the news about these young men who are just coming out of the NFL who have a lot of memory problems already. So there's something there that we as a community don't understand yet uh, scientifically. I think in your son's case, um, it's good they've identified other things that could be causing it because they need to treat all of those first before you can really say for sure you know, what else is going on. Because if your thyroid is low, I mean, it affects, every, it affects the brain, so you have to treat that first. Should I go to the remote? Are there any questions from the remote sites? No, you were very good. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Is there a, okay. Are there any more remote sites besides that? There should be. Okay. Are there any other remote sites that have questions? Apparently not. Okay, yeah. Go ahead. Are there any implications for vegetarians and, and vegans? Okay. No, so there, there's not, uh, they've studied it, there, but there's not evidence either way that vegetarians are, you know, a, a step above in terms of risk reduction. So the best evidence is for the Mediterranean diet, which has little, you know, except for fish, really it encourages, you know, less meat, um, especially red meat. I think there's something we'll see with red meat and cognition and memory in the future uh, from the studies that have been done. But we should, if you eat no meat, which we don't, we eat no meat, um, we should have our B12 checked regularly. Yeah, so there, when you're a vegetarian or a vegan, there are things that you can miss in your diet. Um, but most vegetarians are you know, really aware of that, so they try to eat it from other vegetable sources. But it's always important to tell your doctor that if you're a vegetarian so that they know to look. Go ahead. You mentioned uh, Cleveland a site that has very good uh, information on it. Yeah. What is that? So the question is about the website I mentioned. Um, actually, it's a national association called the Alzheimer's Association. Um, I, I don't know how they are. Um, I'm sorry, I'm a little bit out of water here. I don't know how they are in Nevada. Um, they're pretty good. Okay, so they're, they're good in Nevada too. In Ohio, they're fantastic, especially in the Cleveland area. So if you Google the Alzheimer's Association, it'll come right up. You can put in your zip code. And they have a lot of great information about all different types of dementia. The other thing they're really great at is caregiver support. So a lot of the families who are taking care of patients with dementia, they have support groups, they have social workers that only work with caregivers. They're fantastic. And one thing, I work with a mostly inner city population in Cleveland. So one reason I really like them is a lot of their services are free. So that cost is not an issue. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. So the question is about low cholesterol, is it harmful to the brain? Not that I know of. I haven't seen anything that says that low cholesterol is um, harmful. I think people with low cholesterol would probably get excited if I told them they could eat like a high cholesterol diet. Some people would be happy. I haven't seen anything like that. Okay, other questions? Go ahead. Oh, I just had a question regarding one of the myths because it said Alzheimer's disease is not fatal, but the truth is there are no survivors. But so if somebody says that author died from Alzheimer's dementia, is that the actual cause or right. what is the thought process there? So what we're seeing is that most of the time uh, providers like physicians who are doing death certificates are not listing Alzheimer's or dementia as the cause of death. They list something else like aspiration pneumonia. But the reason the person has aspiration pneumonia is because they lost their ability to swallow from dementia. So there's a movement now 
to have uh, providers, if they think dementia is at all related, to put it so that we can actually get uh, an idea of how many people are dying as a result. I think that's why the numbers are low for that reason. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, my question is twofold. Okay. Um, what if someone was diagnosed with early Alzheimer's and it's a year into that and they develop thyroid function problems? So the, the question is about if you have a genetic form of dementia and you develop after a diagnosis some thyroid problems, how does that um, interplay? So it's important, all those things that, can, that we check at the beginning, um, you should check on a regular basis because they're not going to help things if they're off. So for example, if you have dementia and then you develop a low thyroid, um, you want to treat that because that low thyroid could worsen things. And, and you want the brain to have the most optimal condition to function in because it has all these problems already with the disease. So it would be important to treat the thyroid. You may not see an improvement, but what we know is that when we treat it, people do better. So that, and what's your second question? Oh, uh, I heard a lot about, that you talked about the Mediterranean diet, but I heard a lot about being uh, gluten-free, gluten, yeah. uh, not being good for the brain. Right. Are you going on a gluten-free diet? Yes, yeah, so uh, the question's about gluten-free diets and memory. Uh, I haven't seen any studies that show that the gluten-free diet benefits memory in terms of if you already have dementia, making it better, or in terms of prevention. Um, I think there are ongoing studies now because gluten has really, gluten-free diet has really taken off, at least in the Midwest. I don't know if it has here. And um, a lot of people are using gluten-free diets for many medical conditions. So I think there is a big push to study it. And I haven't seen anything, though, that shows that, that it's helpful for the brain, specifically for memory. Go ahead. Is the term um, senility out of the picture now in this? It's just yeah, I, uh, the question is about the term senility. So um, I don't use it in my practice because there's all these other terms that really describe it better. Um, I, I don't know, uh, even some of my attendings who have been practicing for you know, several years longer than me do not use that term. I think it's because we don't know what, what does that mean. You know, does it mean they have a delirium in a hospital stay? Because that could, that's, it could mean that. Does it mean they have memory loss from dementia? What type of dementia? Is it mixed? Is it, so it's not as specific. It's sort of a general term that I think everyone's getting away from. Yeah, so the question is about when an older person you know, is up in their 90s and says a phrase like, if I knew I was going to live this long, I would kill myself. So uh, I have had patients say that to me before because you know, they're in their 100s and they say, it's not really that fun to live. I'm in pain and I, I don't like it. Um, usually what I do, um, I can't speak for all physicians, but what I do is I, I usually start probing further about mood. So to see, you know, is that just an off-the-cuff phrase that they don't really mean, or is there actually a mood problem like depression or something else going on? Um, the other thing that we always ask about in that kind of situation is, is there a plan? So it's a different thing if someone says, um, you know, I think I want to kill myself, and then you ask, do you have a plan? How would you do it? And they, they're like, why would I even think of a plan? Versus, yes, I've thought about it. I'm going to take my medic all this extra medication or that kind of thing. So if there is an immediate harm to the patient, the physician does have a responsibility to do something. Um, but if it doesn't seem like they're an immediate harm, they can you know, proceed with treating the underlying cause. I I've had patients where um, if you treat their pain you know, from their arthritis, it can dramatically improve their mood alone because no one wants to function where they hurt day in and day out. That's a not good quality of life. So if you improve the quality of life sometimes, that on its own is helpful to people. Uh, any other? Yeah, go ahead. What is your opinion about taking statins? Now there's compelling evidence that statins affect your brain and your memory. Right. Yeah, so the question's about statins and memory. 
So there, um, it, statins are an interesting area because there is a big study done that, sh that actually showed statins improve memory. Like the, all these patients that were on statins compared to placebo and they had better memory functioning, um, even controlling for other factors. There are also studies in the opposite direction. So I, I, don't, um, I don't know what that means. You know, I don't know when I have really good evidence in both directions what to do with that. Um, I do believe that there is an ongoing study um, to look at does it actually, if, if you're normal and you take a statin, does it, does it cause further problems? Um, does it cause memory problems? Right now, I don't recommend statins for just treating memory alone. You know, that's not indicated. But what's good for the heart is good for the brain. So anything that improves vasculature we know will help. So if your cholesterol is high, it's reasonable to be on a statin if it's not controlled by diet. But we don't have great evidence about harm versus benefit in terms of memory. We have good evidence about cholesterol. There's evidence that there's harm to your memory in your brain. So there's evidence, but there's also evidence that for good. So when we have conflicting studies, it's hard, uh, at least from my perspective, to know what to say. Um, I, I like something definitive when I tell people, you know, do this or not do this. Heard something about uh, is it called Wellbutrin? Wellbutrin? That it can also contribute to dementia. Um, the question for long periods of time. So the question is about Wellbutrin contributing to dementia. I have not seen that um, study myself, so I can't really comment um, specifically. I do have patients that are on Wellbutrin, um, and you know, if there's an indication for them to be on it, we tend to keep them on it. But I'll have to look that up because yeah. it's not, not something I'm aware of. How are we on time? Well, I think we have time for one more. Okay, one more question. I answer everyone's questions. Yeah. Thank you guys for coming.